Well, we are in 2 Corinthians, and I uh, just want a quick recap of last time. Paul is beginning to defend himself against those who have been critical of him because his plans to visit them got changed. Uh, some people be, were critical of him, saying he can't be trusted, you know, things like that. Uh, and Paul reminds them and demonstrates to them that his plans are not flippy. He, he has sincere and genuine godliness and holiness before them. He does not have ulterior motives. He has a good conscience. And once the Corinthians understand that, they're going to boast about him. They're going to be proud of him just as he is of them. But he is not being unstable. He is not being vacillating. He is not being uh, two-faced. He is not being indecisive. Just his plans got changed. So he's going to continue from that. Um, starting in verse 18 through verse 22, I want to read that for you. Uh, it says, uh, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it's always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes us both, both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his, set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So he just says, as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. I mentioned a while ago, just another quick review, there are some who are critical of Paul saying that he is being wishy-washy because his plans got changed. He didn't get to visit them twice like he said he wanted to, so, well, then he's just a loser. He's not worth believing in. He's being, he's being dishonest. He's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He says yes, but he means no. That's what they're criticizing Paul of. He's flaky. He plans to visit us, but he's not really planning to visit us. He says he's going to visit us, but he's not going to visit us. That's what they're saying about him. And so you really can't trust what he says. He's so vacillating on his plans to come vis visit us twice instead of he only comes once. And so there's a good reason for these people to not believe anything he says, to doubt whatever he says. Now, that's a difficult thing for us to process because we can't conceive of that's what Paul's ministry is like in the city of Corinth. The people there should love him. Everybody loved him. We've had 2,000 years to process this, and we love him. But they didn't. Some of them didn't. They have this genuine complaint against Paul, and it's really bogus. And Paul says, no way, that's not the case at all. What you're accusing me of is not the case. And he even calls on God as his witness. He invokes God in his defense. It's like making a solemn oath. I swear to God what I'm telling you is the truth. He says, as surely as, 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 surely as God is faithful... That's what he means. It's an oath. It's a solemn oath. He's invoking God as his witness. As surely as God is faithful, and God is faithful, he is faithful to keep his word. God is faithful to keep his promises. God is trustworthy. He is worthy of your faith. He is worthy of, uh, your, for you to depend on him. As surely as God is faithful, we are too. You can depend on us too. We're too. We're faithful too. As surely as God is faithful, we did not come with you to you or make plans regarding visiting you as yes and no. I'm not saying one thing to you while intending to do something different. It's not yes and no. That's basically what he means. As surely as God is faithful, I am too. As surely as God is faithful and you can trust him and depend on him because he always keeps what he says he's going to do, you can depend on me too. And this is basically an important character trait for all of us to live by. Just a quick little application. We need to keep our word too. That's basically what he's saying. I've kept my word to you. I promised something to you and I'm faithful to do it just like God is. 
it's wrong for us to say yes to something but really mean no. If you're telling someone that you're going to do something or be somewhere and then you have no intention of doing it or being there, that's wrong. If you are going to um, say you won't do something but then you plan to do it anyway, that's wrong. In fact, that's not Christian at all. That's contrary to what God's character is like. And if God lives in you by his spirit and Jesus Christ has saved you because he is Lord and you're trusting him, you can't be living like that. And Paul's not that way either. And the Corinthians ought to know that Paul is not like that. They ought to know of his honesty to keep his word, even if his travel plans got changed. Because they did, they got changed. But he's honest. You can trust him. And because they can trust him, they can also trust the gospel that he preaches. See, that's where the critics are going with this. If you can't trust Paul, then you can't trust the message that he says. And then you also can't trust the message that Silas and Timothy preached along with him. The message is trustworthy. And they're like, you can't believe Paul, so his message is flawed too. Throwing doubt on the gospel just by doubting the veracity and the integrity of the messenger. And some of that I get, you know, if, if, the, if the messenger's messed up and anything comes out of his mouth, I'm not listening to. But if the gospel is true, even if the messenger is messed up, but Paul is not. This just says in verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. Now let me just do a quick, very quick word order here. The word order is, Paul is emphatic on Son of God. And by Son of God, he's also emphatic on God. So when he says the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he is putting emphasis on Jesus being God in the flesh. Jesus is God, his deity. And I just want to point that out. That's not the main point of that text, but Jesus is God. And by Paul saying the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he's emphasizing that. And he was portrayed to you in the gospel as crucified and resurrected. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22 and 24. He says, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. When we were there with you, we preached that Jesus Christ was crucified. He died on the cross. It's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And again, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Verse 2, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the message we preach to you is trustworthy. The message that we preach to you, the gospel message of Jesus being the Son of God, being crucified on a cross and being raised from the dead, that has credibility in it. And it's not just the message, it's the credibility of the messenger too. Paul says, our message was not yes and no. And he includes Silas and Timothy in that too. Their credibility is at stake. And by their credibility, by extension, the whole apostolic community credibility is at stake because all of them went there and preached. Well, not all the apostles. We know Peter did. That was one of the little uh, schisms they had, one of the splits they had in the church. Oh, we're of Peter. Do you have even problems with the apostolic community because they didn't like that Paul changed his plans? Doesn't make any sense, but that's what they were like. They preached the gospel to them. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they were there too. Let me just give you a brief history. Paul uh, was in Corinth, Acts chapter 18, and he had been traveling from Macedonia down there. He went to Athens and then he went to Corinth. But he had left Silas and Timothy, who were also traveling with him, back in Macedonia. And it says in Acts 18.5, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. 
So Paul had been in Corinth and he got a little job going with uh, Priscilla and Aquila making tents. Y'all remember that? Working. Then when Silas and Timothy got there from Macedonia, then he could devote more full-time effort into preaching. But Silas and Timothy were there preaching too. And Paul's association with Silas goes all the way back to Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council. They had already gone to Galatia, and Paul had already been stoned, and he comes back to Antioch, and then there's some Jews that came up from, Antioch, from Jerusalem and said, you have to be circumcised, and it made a big stink, and Paul and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem, and then they had this council down there. And when they had the council and figured out what they were going to do about the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ without having to be circumcised, that episode says in Acts 15, verse 22, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, two men who were leaders among the, church, among the brothers. So Silas was there. Silas goes back to Antioch with Paul. Then later on, I don't know how long it was, but Paul says, let's go back and visit the churches in Galatia. Let's go back and visit the churches that we started. Okay, good idea, Barnabas. I mean, good idea, Paul. So Paul and Barnabas talked about it, and Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, who abandoned them in the first trip, and Paul and Barnabas got into a big fight. It says uh, Acts 15, 39 and 41, Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of, of, the, to the, grace of the Lord, and he went through Cilicia and Cil Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So Paul and Silas are now on a mission trip. Barnabas takes Mark to Cyprus. And then they get back to the churches in Galatia, the places where Paul was stoned before with Barnabas, and he says he met, says, meets this guy named Timothy up there in Acts 16. In verse, uh, verse 3 and 4, it says, Paul wanted to take Timothy along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Therefore, Timothy was probably not circumcised because his dad was not circumcised. And so Paul says, well, you're a Jew also because his mother was a Jew. Uh, so he takes him with him. They all knew his father was a Greek, and they traveled from town to town. They delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So they're all preaching the gospel. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Not just Paul, but this is a, an entourage, a mission team. They're preaching the gospel in all these towns. Where do they go? And they're preaching this gospel of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the, from the dead. And their credibility is in question too because they travel with Paul. They're guilty by association. So Paul says, no, I'm speaking for them too. In verse 19, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that we preach to you, the gospel that me and Ty Silas and Timothy preached to you was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been yes. I've read this ever since I've been a Christian. It's like, what does that mean? Well, I know this. Jesus is the truth. I'm the truth, the life, and the way, he said. Because he's the truth, he never breaks his word. He always keeps his word. His word is unchangeable, and he always remains true to it. He doesn't waver back and forth and flip-flop around. He is the truth, and he does what he says. So Jesus, the Son of God, his message is true and secure and solid and stable and trustworthy. Now, just because Paul's plans get changed, and he doesn't get to travel the way he would like to travel to go back to visit the, the Corinthians twice, just because he has to adjust his plans does not make the credibility of the gospel, doesn't question that. The gospel's still true. Jesus Christ is true. It's not yes and no. It's yes. I mean, do you see where the critics are going with this? The critics are making it so that the gospel is in peril here. They don't like Paul, so they don't like the gospel. 
But there is no contradiction in Jesus Christ. It's always been yes. It has always been true. It has always been stable. It has always been trustworthy. This message that we preach to you has always been yes. Jesus Christ is yes. It's true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I just didn't put that in my notes for you up there, but Hebrews 13, 8. He's the same. He's the same. Always the same. Always true. Always yes. And Paul says in verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Literally, it just says, as many as, or whatever, the promises God has made. As many as promises, as many promises as God has made, or whatever the promises God has made, in other words, all of the promises of God, all of them are yes in Christ Jesus, which means they're all true, and God's going to fulfill every single one of them. Yes is what that means. He is going to remain faithful to himself and fulfill the promises that he has made. In Christ Jesus, all of the promises that God has made to his people, to Israel, to the church, to you and me, they're all true. He's going to make them all happen. God will keep them all. And he has kept them all. In fact, he already has. He kept all of his promises by sending Christ into the world. It says in Romans 15, 8 and 9, I tell you that, that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. So it goes all the way back to Abraham. God promised Abraham what? That he would bless all the families of the earth. He would bless all the nations through Abraham. Which means Abraham was the, the first Hebrew. He was the first one of Israel. Although Israel wasn't, that's his grandson. But the promise was to Abraham. And it was going to be fulfilled in the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to be saved. God's going to save Gentiles. People who aren't Jews. You and me. There are no Jews in this room, I presume. We're all Gentiles. And because that's true, God's promise has been kept. Through Christ Jesus, he sent his son into the world to die for the sins of the world that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. <clears throat> it's the leftover from last week. It's been kept. All of the promises that God has made are yes. And uh, I feel like I'm lame here when you start talking about the promises of God, you find yourself in this place where you just don't have the time to chase every one of them down. But they're all fulfilled in Christ and the ones that are still yet to happen, God's gonna fulfill all those too in Christ. Charles Spurgeon wrote, the promises of God are to the believer, and I love the word he said, an inexhaustible mine of wealth. He's like, we could stay all day and just talk about God's promises and never run out of stuff to talk about. Inexhaustible. But they're all yes. They're all yes. 1 John chapter 2, 24 and 25. John writes, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us eternal life well I can tell you this I know this for sure that's a yes that's a yes all that stuff all eternal life all of them by faith we know that God always fulfills his promises in Christ Jesus amen I say amen because I don't say amen a lot I wanted to that time but it's in the next verse and so through him, verse 20, the amen is spoken to by us or through us to the glory of God. 
Amen is a universal word. It's a Hebrew word, but every country, every language says amen. The same word, amen. And so no one has their own word to say in place of amen. It's really a universal word. Almost all the languages transliterated from a Hebrew word, but it means it's true. It means so be it. Uh, an affirmation, a confirmation of a statement. That's true. Uh, we used to say, I know that's right. Amen. Or I heard that. You ever heard anybody say that? I heard that. Amen. And when we say amen, because God keeps his promises, and we say amen, we praise the Lord, we glorify him. We glorify his name. That's what he says. Through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. When you say amen to the promises of God and you trust him and you believe that he's gonna provide everyone, uh, a fulfillment for every single one of them to you personally, to Israel, to the church, all of his promises, all of them are, are, are true. All of them are yes. And when you say that and you say amen, you're giving God glory. It would be essentially for you to say the same thing as amen, you would say, praise you, God, for making such a glorious promise and then keeping it. That's what, you, that's what you mean. And we live by that. We live by faith in that. We hang on to that. We cling to that. God made a promise of eternal life to whoever believes in his son, and we believe that. We hang on to that. We say, yes, and then we say, amen, so be it. I know that's right. I heard that. Jesus is Lord. Glory to God. That's what amen is. And so Paul's saying, you guys that are critical, the, guy, the people in Corinth that are critical of him miss the whole thing. God has made promises and he's gonna fulfill all of them. They are yes in Christ Jesus and we're just gonna praise him and say amen and glorify him. And he says in verse 21, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Well, here's why the critics have lame arguments. This is why the, the, the critics who, are, who argue against Paul and complain against Paul for whatever, travel plans being fluctuating or anything that's circumstantial for that matter, Anything that happens that messes up what you said you wanted to do, for critics who have an argument against that, it's completely lame. And here's why it's lame. Because it's God who does it. If it all depended on us, it would fall apart today. It's not gonna make it through the week. But it doesn't depend on us. It's all God's work. It's all God's work in Paul, and it's all of God's work in the Corinthians too. Anything you want to complain about Paul is uh, to question his veracity is just really truly lame because it's God who makes us stand firm. He does this for us. He authenticates his servants by his own will, by his own power, by his own grace through Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. God does this. The word means establishes. I think some of the translations say establish. Confirms, verifies, proves to be true. The word means to be made to stand on your own feet. God makes it so that you and me and Paul and the Corinthians and all of us who belong to him together stand on our own feet. He makes it so that'll happen. He sets us firm in our place. He makes us to be solid. It's a technical term. It's a legal term. It means to designate properly guaranteed security. God makes it so his people, you and me, all of us who belong to Jesus Christ, all of us who trust Jesus, he makes it so you will stand firm. You will be established. God secures us and makes us to be strong in him. 
No argument that you can make against Paul or any of us is going to stand because God's the one that makes us stand. It's a present tense verb too. It's the, he continually makes us to stand firm. He continually confirms us. He continually establishes us. He continually verifies us and proves us to be true. Nothing you do on your own, nothing you do on your own strength, nothing that you can do to make that happen, God does it. Same word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. It says, he will keep you strong. That's the same word. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord is faithful. He does this. God makes us strong. You don't do it yourself. You don't do it yourself. You don't have the strength to do it on your own. He does it for us. He does it to us. He does it in us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. That means set you apart, make you holy through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, he will do it. You know how, you, you know how you, you're going to be a strong, firm Christian standing when Christ comes, when he comes again to resurrect our bodies and give us a new body, a glorified body? You know how you're going to be faithful on that day and standing firm when he comes, established? You know how that's going to be? You know why that is? Because he does it. You and I, we're going to fall apart and flake every day. But God's the one who does this. We don't do this on our own. I didn't think of this until this morning after I already made my notes. Philippians chapter 2, 13 says, God works in you. God works in you both to will and to act and to do according to his, good, his pleasure. God's the one that works it in us to fulfill his purpose in our lives. God's the one who works in us to accomplish his will in us, to make us strong, to make us a, a firm, standing believer. Not you. God's the one who gave us faith to believe. God's the one who keeps us in him. He makes it so that we remain solid. He makes it so that we are established, firm, unmoved, fixed, strong in the faith. Now, all of us here are not on the same level of our faith, but we believe in Jesus Christ and we cling to him and we hang on to him and we're gonna stand with him and God's gonna be the one that makes that happen. He always does. That's what it means, yes. It's always yes. He makes us firm. He does this for us and to us through faith in Jesus Christ, his son, and he does that in relation to our union with Christ. We have been made one with Christ. We are in him and he does this. God has established us securely. 1 Peter 5, 10 and 11, it says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Struggle a little bit here and there. You're going to have to suffer a little bit. It's going to be bad, but it's only going to be by his grace, his calling, and he will restore you. He will make you strong. He will make you firm. He will make you steadfast. Then, by the way, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Praise him. Amen. Praise him. God makes us strong. We wouldn't be strong Christians on our own. We don't have the will to do that. And we don't have the uh, struggle with our sin nature. We struggle with our flesh. We're falling away half the time, half the day anyway. God keeps us strong. And, verse 21, he anointed us. And literally, that means to dab or to smear or to rub oil or ointment on you. That's what anoint means. 
it's used in the Bible mostly as a figurative sense, although they literally poured oil on you or rubbed oil on you. But figuratively, it means to consecrate or to set apart for some work, a sacred work, to assign a person a task. It's uh, with how they would anoint a king, they'd pour oil on him, or a priest, they would pour oil on him. But it was to set apart as a ceremony, as a commission for service. But this text here says, God anointed us. And he tells us how he anointed us too. Paul says he anointed us with the Holy Spirit. Verse 21 and 22, he anointed us and set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts. That's how he anointed us. He put his spirit in us. He put his spirit in our hearts. The scripture says the same thing about Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter's preaching to um, Cornelius and the, the Romans who were there in um, Caesarea with him. Cornelius, those guys, those Roman soldiers. <clears throat> and he says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. It means the same thing with us. He anointed us with the Holy Spirit. He made him to live in our hearts, anointing us. And Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 when he's in the synagogue there in um, uh, Nazareth. Yeah, Nazareth. And he says in verse chapter Luke, in Luke 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. So Jesus is claiming this for himself. And Peter says the same thing about Jesus in Acts, Acts 10. God put his spirit in our hearts. That's his anointing. The spirit lives in us. The spirit dwells in us. That's the anointing that we have. John writes about the same thing. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. Doesn't say the Holy Spirit here, but I know that's what he's talking about because he says, and all of you <clears throat> know the truth. In verse 27, he says, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you. I know John's talking about the Holy Spirit because he wrote the book of John, the same John that wrote that book, and he remembers Jesus telling him this stuff. And he told this to all of his disciples. He said in John 14, 26, when the, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Well, if the Holy Spirit's in you and he teaches you all things, then you don't need anyone to teach you anymore. That's what he means. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus also said in John 16, 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth, which is what John says in 1 John, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. You know the truth because the Holy Spirit came and lived in your heart and teaches you the truth, opens your eyes and lets you see the glory of God in the face of Christ and you call on him and believe him. You know who Jesus is because the Holy Spirit has anointed us. That's what he means. That's exactly what he means. God has anointed us with the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And then Paul continues in verse 22. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts. He set his seal of ownership on us. Now, in the Greek, that's just one word. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And the word ownership is not in the text, but that's what this means. That's what the word means. One Greek word, it means a seal of ownership. It's designed to make something secure as a sign of authenticity, a sign of ownership. You make a seal, you seal it with your, with your stamp, and it's yours. It's a, it's a seal to prove that we belong to God, ownership. It's a stamp, an identity mark. He anointed us with the Holy Spirit to come live in their hearts. 
and sealed us with this mark, with this, with this identity stamp to prove that we belong to God. This is all the work of God. This has nothing to do with you. You didn't do any of this. You couldn't do any of this. God did all of this. Ephesians 1, 13. Having believed, it's the same Greek word, having believed you were marked in him with a seal. Marked with a seal is that same word. The promised Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 4, 30, same word. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we're sealed, it marks us as being owned by him, a seal of ownership, that's what it means. It's actually a good translation, even though it's only one word in the Greek. What he means, it's a seal of ownership. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and gave us the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. He is the anointing. The Spirit is the seal. He sealed us for himself and he lives in our hearts. Let's camp on that for just a minute. First, uh, chapter, Galatians 4 verse 6, he says, Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Romans 5, 5, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know, when it says in our hearts, he basically just means that he lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He dwells in us. He's in us and never going to go away from us. He's in our hearts. He came to us. He opened our eyes so we could see the glory of Christ. He regenerate, regenerated us. He, <clears throat> he made us alive in Christ. He dwells in us. Jesus said in John 14, the world cannot accept him, the spirit of truth, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. God has done this. He has anointed us. He has anointed us and set his seal of ownership on us by putting the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It says in the... Uh, Verse 22, he anointed us, sell his seal of ownership on us, put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And all that's one word in the Greek too. A deposit guaranteeing what is to come, one word. But that's what it means too. It's a legal, a legal commercial term. It's a commercial term, like when you, you buy stuff. An advanced transaction to guarantee the validity of the contract that you'll end up making the full purchase price down the road. Right now, we just make an advance payment, a deposit. You make a deposit, that means you're guaranteed to pay the whole thing off later. That's what this means. We just call it a down payment. The first installment on a loan, you make your first down payment, that's yours. You're going to pay it off until you make the final payment, it's all yours. The full amount will be paid. It's an engagement ring. You give a girl an engagement ring, you're going to marry her. Uh, an old English word is in um, earnest payment. We don't ever say those words anymore. I just said it because it's an old English word. Interesting word too, but it's only used three times in the whole Bible. The whole, the whole New Testament, this word, and every time it's used, all three times, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. This one that we're in now, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, but also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, says, now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Same word. About the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Having believed, I read this a while ago, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. All this means is that God is the one who saved us by his sovereign will, 
by his grace, by him just wanting to save us. He's the one that gave us the Holy Spirit. We would have never come to Christ on our own. The Holy Spirit came and regenerated us and let us see that we were sinners and let us see that we were condemned. Let us see that we needed a Savior. Let us see that Jesus is that Savior. Let us see that Jesus paid the debt for our sins and let us have faith to call on him to save us. And anybody who calls on him, he will save. The Holy Spirit did that. God did that. And if God's the one that did that in the first place and he gives us the Holy Spirit to live in us as a seal, as a deposit, as the one who makes us strong, who establishes us, then I can tell you this, your salvation in Christ Jesus, your salvation is certain, it is secure, it is not gonna, it's not gonna fall away, it's not gonna be minimized, it's not gonna die. Your salvation is secure. That's what this means. He's not going to take it away. You know, if you make a deposit on something and you don't follow through, you lose your deposit. That's what it's for, right? You have to make a deposit so you promise them to pay it all back. And if you don't pay it, you lose the deposit too. Well, God's not going to forfeit his deposit. He made his deposit in us by giving us the Holy Spirit. He's gonna bring that all the way through to the very end. We are saved in Christ Jesus. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He made the deal himself. He gave it himself and it's eternal security. It's ours. And I, I, I don't wanna minimize it. I think it's the most important thing there is. God does all of this himself. This is the work of God. This is the doctrine our salvation does not depend on us. All of us would fall away by the end of the week if it depended on us. If the Holy Spirit were temporary, we wouldn't have him by the end of the day. I wouldn't. Y'all might, I wouldn't. Andrew wouldn't. All the rest of you might have him a couple more days. But he stays in us. He is a deposit for us. It is eternally secure. Our salvation is secure. God makes us strong. He makes us stand firm. He secures our eternal inheritance. He establishes us. He makes us certain. He makes us solid in our faith. He gives us the Holy Spirit as an anointing, as a calling for himself. He seals us and makes us to be his own. He has anointed us and made us his own. We, he owns us. We belong to him by the Holy Spirit. He unites us to Christ. He marks us. We are authentic. We belong to him. He is the deposit. He is the down payment. The wedding's coming and all of his bride is going to be there with him because he made us his bride. It's gonna happen. And he will, he has promised to deliver the final installment, our salvation, our final salvation when we see him face to face and we are changed to be like him and we are resurrected into our new bodies in the twinkling of an eye in a flash. All that stuff, that's a promise of God. It's gonna happen. And God's gonna be the one to do it, not you. And all that's required of you is faith to believe. the doctrine of the security of our salvation, the doctrine of assurance that God will keep us in Christ until the very last day. That's what this is. God makes us strong. So all of the detractors, all of the complainers, all of the critics who say that you don't have your act together, they don't know enough about me. They only know a little bit. But God is the one who makes me secure, not them. And he gets all the glory for it too. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for your word today and thank you that you've been kind to me to let me preach it. Thank you for the grace you gave me to be able to study and put it together. 
Thank you for uh, being merciful to our ears and letting us all hear you speak to us through your word. And Father God, I just pray that you will work grace in all of our lives, that we would look to you in faith and look to Jesus Christ and just believe and know that we are secure in him because of your work in us to make us strong, your work in us and to giving us the Holy Spirit. You have secured us, you have sealed us, you have given us, a, you have made a deposit so that we are eternally secure, Father. Praise you, praise you. Let that be all of us here in this room, all of us, every one of us. We belong to Jesus Christ forever. And the Holy Spirit is in us to prove that. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.